This September, I attended the FUE Europe conference in Madrid, where hundreds of world's leading hair transplant surgeons and dermatologists came together to discuss the future of hair restoration. From new surgical techniques, smart tools, to the newest breakthroughs in hair loss treatments. I was invited to speak there, representing the voice of patients. Showcase your hair transplant excellence, communicate the trust, great patient care, and also communicating safety that the patient feels safe. And sharing what clinics do wrong, oftentimes when trying to attract educated patients online, and also help them to get noticed in a good light on social media. And although there were like 80 plus presentations and so many of them were incredibly interesting since we don't have so much time in today's video i decided to share with you the four most important ones the ones that directly impact you somebody who is either losing hair planning a hair transplant or using treatments like finasteride or minoxidil so let's start with the presentation number one what stood out not just to me but also many young up-and-coming hair doctors sitting in the audience was Dr. Felipe Pitella from Brazil. He introduced a brand new AI-powered scalp scanning system, something that could completely change the way doctors are estimating the grafts before the hair transplant surgery. The software uses four different neural network models to analyze your scalp, estimating the total grafts needed for the surgery with respect to not only your head shape, but also depending on the degree of miniaturization in the individual sections of your scalp. Here he showed us that even two patients with the same Norwood pattern, let's say two Norwood 3 individuals, can require totally different graft counts just because of their head shape and the curvature of the skull. The tool also visualizes miniaturized zones in different colors, so the doctors can identify exactly which zones are miniaturizing faster and which ones slower. It pretty much looks like a heat map of your hair loss. During his live demonstration, we saw how this could make the pre-surgical planning far more accurate. Now, once hair restoration doctors will implement this technology in their practices, we Will this graft estimation tool give them a very precise quote or might it result in some overquoting of patients? And this is something that some hair restoration doctors who are interested in this technology were asking themselves. If it actually ends up being very precise, it means one thing for the patient more personalized and more predictable graft estimates instead of guesswork. Dr. Petella also gave a second talk about his 10-step hair transplant surgical approach to perform his GIGA sessions. And that gave us a more detailed insight into how these high graft sessions could be actually performed safely. Interestingly, he starts with incisions first before doing any extraction and then runs extractions and implantation phase simultaneously. He has a bigger team to do this naturally, otherwise it wouldn't be possible to do such high graft sessions in a day. With this system, his clinic can perform massive sessions of 6,000 to 7,000 scalp grafts and even 4 to 5,000 beard grafts being extracted in one to two days as a one session. And here's what I want to highlight, guys. Just because Dr. Pitella is able to perform these giga sessions, it doesn't make other clinics in the industry equal equally qualified and skilled to be able to do the same. He's pushing the limits, but he's not representing the overall level of the hair restoration industry as a whole. He's pretty much an outlier. Now, he also customizes his punches for especially beard extraction, usually 0.7 to 0.77 millimeters, which is among the smallest but not quite the smallest in the industry. This is all important to minimize facial scarring when extracting the grafts from either the beard area or the neck area. I really enjoyed Dr. Pitella's presentations. The only thing that I was asking as a patient was, what is gonna be the lifespan of the grafts oftentimes extracted during these high giga sessions where you usually have to go as a doctor high up or lower down in the donor area and reach the graft 
crafts that are normally part of the unsafe regions. These are the regions where the DHT resistance of these crafts doesn't seem to be as permanent. At least that's what many doctors in the industry are thinking. And this is pretty much where some doctors are separated. Some doctors think it's not gonna matter as much, while other doctors, usually older doctors, more traditional doctors who started doing a lot of FUTs back in the days, they kind of think that this might be a problem in the future. I guess time will tell. But there is one thing that I also noticed. It was that a good majority of the giga sessions before and after results that Dr. Pitella presented during his speeches, the men were already high Norwoods and they were in their late 30s or older, which means that the final picture of where that safe donor zone may end up being defined will be definitely more clear by somebody who is in his 40s than a 20 year old or somebody in his early 30s where that perceived safe donor zone can still change over the course of the next 5, 10 or 15 years. Now the next highlight came from Dr. Alvaro Tulio, who presented something I have never seen before. It's an ultrasound study showing how minoxidil actually helps scalp blood flow. He applied 5% minoxidil in a trichosal base, scanned the scalp before the application and then again scanned the scalp 40 minutes after applying minoxidil. Now before applying minoxidil only about 6.4% of the scanned area was vascularized. And after 45 minutes, it was 21.9%. This is a 241% increase in microcirculation. But that's not all. The ultrasound actually showed a 38% reduction in skin stiffness, which means that the tissue became more relaxed. Dr. Tulio further hypothesized that this relaxation could help prolong the antigen phase, the active hair growth phase. And this study is part of Dr. Tulio's own clinical research. It hasn't been published anywhere in any of the medical literature and neither it has been peer reviewed. But I still appreciate his interest in doing this type of research because it gives us a real-time visual proof of how minoxidil could actually boost the blood flow. But to me, it doesn't really matter how minoxidil works. The most important thing is that it works and you are able to maximize minoxidil effectiveness. And if you want to do that, I'm going to link a video below where you can learn how to maximize your minoxidil's response and minoxidil's effectiveness. Another speech came from Dr. Amanda Pereira from Brazil, presenting on behalf of Dr. Balazar. Dr. Balazar made a study comparing sublingual minoxidil, and this was compared to the traditional 5 milligram oral minoxidil. Now, it was a 24-week study, and both groups improved in hair density, but the difference wasn't statistically significant. Where it did, however, get interesting was the side effect profile. Palpitations occurred in 9% of the oral group, but 0% in the sublingual group. The researchers believe that this is because sublingual administration bypasses the liver's first pass metabolism, which we have already discussed on my channel in the past. And since I had side effects on oral minoxidil, just one milligram, I had hard side effects and I had to stop. Sublingual minoxidil is something that I would still be willing to explore and try out in a safe, low dose manner in the future. So I really like to see these types of results coming out on oral minoxidil sublingual. Back to the side effects though. Hypertrichosis, which means excessive body hair growth, was unfortunately even slightly higher in the sublingual minoxidil group, meaning that the systemic exposure still happens even with sublingual minoxidil. It's just the initial spike in minoxidil in your system. It's something that will be avoided with the sublingual. But in the long run, all of the other related side effects that might be related to swelling, might be related to hypertrichosis, will probably still come even on sublingual minoxidil. So in short, sublingual minoxidil might offer a safer option for men sensitive to heart-related side effects like myself, but we would ideally need a larger study to confirm that. Another form of slow-release oral minoxidil is right now being researched actually, and it's called VDPHL01, and I made a video on it three, four weeks ago, and I'm gonna also link it below in case you guys wanna check this out and see how that works. The final topic I decided to choose for today's quick presentation came from a panel of top surgeons, Dr. Uzgur, Dr. Bizanga, and Dr. Kostas, 
focusing on the use of beard hair in hair restoration. These body hair specialists from Europe and Turkey are able to typically extract from 1000 all the way to 2000 grafts per one single session, one clinic visit. The consensus on the usage of body hair was clear. Beard hair should be used strategically for boosting the density. It's not considered to be a replacement for your scalp hair in your donor area. The limitations of the beard hair are the following. As these experts explained, beard hairs are thicker, they are coarser, they can grow faster than your scalp hair, which can on one hand help you with the density, but on the other create a texture mismatch if used too much. Also, if your facial hair color and textures are way different from your scalp hair color or texture, the usage of beard hair in visible zones of your scalp should be avoided. And similarly to Dr. Patella, these doctors also stressed the use of small punch sizes around 0.7 millimeter when extracting the beard hair from facial areas, which is very important to reduce facial scarring. So these were some presentations from FUE Europe 2025 that will matter the most, in my opinion, to patients like yourself and like myself. It's really inspiring to see how many hair transplant doctors are pushing this field forward. But as always, patients need to separate real advancement and science from marketing. And if you want expert guidance when choosing a hair doctor that applies these innovations ethically and effectively while specializing in your hair type, fits your budget, you can book a one-on-one -on -one consultation with me on the link below or at letsgethair.com slash consultation. That was it from me. Thanks for tuning in and until next time.